MENCAP and the Arts Council present Growing Wild, The Pandemic Through the Eyes of a Poet with Learning Disabilities by Claire Manley and Emma Claire Sweeney. This book is read by Sarah Gordy, Jonathan Rupin and Emma Claire Sweeney. Growing Wild. Fag Woods, number one, fag dated. New curtains are for with it winter tartan harry bone kits and tiles my battery one low texting the verdict mum sister staff and friends the judge asked why i cried go out enjoy it will backdate what your Old furnace to a back room, fist clam, mouth dry. We're not going to get it. I explained, How far can you walk? How many stairs you clammed? Of good. Days and bad, my voice filled the court. Why won't you visit new places alone? You can read a map. My daughter gets lost, my father claimed. The truth, hard to hear. Number two, backlog. Don't panic. My support staff cancelled. Easy for them to say. Skip meals. Body shrinks. Seven stone nine. My only relief, fingernails and knives. I curled on the floor and cried. Working. Tax credit. Housing benefits. Personal independence payments. Let us through my door. New ones each day. The truth hard to hear. Number three. Back track. He thought I was crying wolf, but I held down my house. I work part time. I remembered him, my learning disability, mild. Your tickets cost eleven pounds forty nine. You paid fifteen. How much change do you receive? Orange carpet tiles. Spell words backwards. Chair, cushion, bent, tangerine. I am a doctor, said the assessor, and you are fit as a fiddle. My nerves strung out, my lungs to clog, to sing the truth. Hard to hear. The waiting room from a conversation with Claire's father. God, yeah, we cried. Claire cried when they brought us from the ante room back into the courtroom, when they explained their verdict, when she realised that she'd won on every count. And I just gripped her arm and said, You've done it. The emotion between us that moment was amazing, absolutely amazing. The euphoria of complete agreement. And I could see then that it had been weighing on her terribly. We talked about it, but talk is never enough to explain what's going on in your mind. After the judge had delivered his verdict, I asked him why we'd had to endure such an agonising time. I don't know how much this has affected my daughter, I said, but I know how much it has affected me. And I'm a fairly cool person, really. We've got files this thick, I said, that we've had to keep. Yes, the judge said, we're asking a lot of these sort of questions now. 
We'd managed to squeeze in Claire's tribunal just before the lockdown. It had been delayed and delayed and delayed. At one point, we'd got as far as the courthouse, but the judge didn't turn up. He was unwell, it turned out, so the tribunal went back yet another month. I remember getting in touch, a bit hot under the collar, and saying, look, you've got to get this sorted. It's been going on too long. It had been two years. Two years we'd been waiting. After Claire failed her personal independence payment assessment, her other benefits stopped. Everything. Her housing. Everything clammed up. All the other systems closed down on us. I don't know who I rang. Just so many people. There were all sorts of things we were doing to help her get through. The local council were very good. They set up a special allowance, a contribution towards her flat to help her get through. It's not to do with money. She loves that little house. To her, it's hers. And we're talking about basic living. Claire doesn't live in a big house down the road. Claire lives in a nice little one-room flat, and that's all she asks for. And they were trying to take that away from her, and she was very upset about losing that. I remember the hour we sat in that tribunal answering questions. It was in a massive courthouse. We were down low, behind a desk, and above there was a judge and an adjudicator, a doctor and a learning disability specialist. The judge was quite imposing, quite articulate, but very pleasant, very warm in the end. I think he warmed to us. He warmed to Claire. Claire spoke almost exclusively. She spoke very well, very well indeed. I think it was the adrenaline of the moment. She knew this was last chance saloon. They say you can go through it all again, but your chances get weaker each time. I'd sat down beforehand with Claire and I'd said, this is not a game. You've got to use the right words. We'd been guided on that by lawyers from Mencap. They were amazing. They cut out our emotions and brought us to what we had to deal with, right to its core. You see, two years ago, at the original PIP assessment, Claire had been asked about her part-time job advocating for people with learning disabilities as an access health champion for the NHS. Because she doesn't want to appear different, she says yes to lots of things, which is understandable, isn't it? And you want to flower things up a bit about the things you can do and perhaps make life sound a bit more enjoyable than it is sometimes. That went right against her. So she had to go through all these things again at the tribunal, but this time she had to get her mind to go through it all logically, how it really happens. The level of support she gets from her company, the fact that she can't understand timetables, or the complexities of going into a station and getting up to a platform, of buying tickets, that sort of thing. We had letters to back us up, and of course that's the truth of things. But at the tribunal, Claire had to go through all the hard things, the things she can't do. And that is a mental block you don't always want to go through. But there's been a smile on her face since the tribunal, a spring in her step. Small things make her happy. A nice new coat she bought, a cherry red anorak. Much more than she'd ever spent. She was Cinderella. It was magic. The lockdown. Veins of tissues. Every cough, sneeze and tear, empty packages, chocolate buttons, lemon drizzle, custard creams, all for long full of air, lotments fresh, all to so sweetest, curd and hugs, my friends. But the gatekeeper butterflies have felt from the brambles to my belly. I only let certain people get close, but how will I endure insulation all summer long? Clapping for carers from a conversation with a support worker. That was way back in the beginning, such a lot of uncertainty, so much unknown, the illness still new. In the early days, Claire couldn't leave her flat. For a few weeks, her support was limited to phone calls. That's true. Some people moved away from their homes and back in with their parents, in some cases quite far from here. Other self-isolating tenants we continued to visit, practising social distancing, putting on equipment. We always had ample supplies of PPE. Because of their learning disabilities, some of them struggled. We were patient with them. We had to be. 
It did feel a bit strange going to work, the road so quiet. We carried on doing our duties, doing what we needed to. I can only speak for myself, but it wouldn't have mattered whether people clapped or not. Although it was recognition, I suppose. We were not NHS, but still key workers. And we carried on as best we could. When we realised there were safe ways to visit, Claire met me outside to take the air. That, of course, was summertime. I just asked how she was doing, how she was feeling, always trying to get a feel for her mood. One human being to another, really, listening to what she had to say. We took a stroll one time along a tree-lined canal and stopped at a lock to talk. Quiet spot by a bridge, where strangers couldn't overhear. I was concerned for her, surrounded day and night by those same four walls. The right time. Time to move. I told them it was time Dad agreed. Months to find a social worker. Years to find a flat. Filled of lads. It was a waterlog cell. Rising spores that clogged my lungs. Finally, I moved to a house by the canals. Seven years I've lived here. On front door, on back door, on walking chair and cushions, on unicorn hand warmer and unicorn toys. In March, I turned off the soul, planted daffodils of fusa. I was looking out the window when my boss called where clothes sing the office she told me how long i don't know weeks i spent alone no support staff no friends still i rose early Fried bacon and eggs on Mondays. No, I couldn't work at the allotment still. I spooned porridge with golden syrup. Boo, I couldn't take the 500 bars to work alone. I could hear the whistling of tits and robins. My neighbours practising his saxophone and scrape of their chairs at meal times. The hams of their talk. I texted my parents. I think it's time. Mum told me, time to return. Shield, from a conversation with Claire's mother. Claire originally wanted to stay at home. That was her decision. We'd said, why don't you move back in with us? No, she said, I'll stay here. Fair enough, I said. But we thought she would move back in the end. And after three weeks of no one going into her flat, she did change her mind. Her carers weren't going into her either. They might have had good reason, but they didn't communicate their decisions with us. We were upset about that. We did get her support from a local charity. Some people who picked up bits of shopping for Claire. That was very helpful. But you know, if Claire wants something, she wants it now. Time doesn't mean a lot to Claire. She says something's happening in five minutes, but it could be two hours from now. So her dad used to pop down with groceries too, knock on her door, then leave them on the doorstep and stand back each time. I think Claire thought, oh, it's not so nice. You know, no one going inside. It must have been lonely. So after three weeks of us all self-isolating, we drove to Claire's flat to collect her. 
She hadn't been out for weeks. I said, look, Claire, I think you're okay to come for a short walk with me, just around the block. We didn't want her to mix with people, definitely didn't want her to go to the shops. There wasn't much she could do, but she's really taken to gardening. At her block, the front garden is shared, but the rear one is hers. She must have missed her garden, but she tidied the edges of our lawn and she planted sunflowers and vegetables. There were only four broad beans and she doesn't usually eat them, but she said they were absolutely delicious. Claire and her boyfriend talked every day on the phone. They've always been very modest in what they like to do. Simple pleasures, good pleasures, going out now and then for a meal. I think she found it quite hard, especially towards the end. She just wanted to get back to her home and her job, back to her routine. The shielding just kept going on and on. Claire likes going out, meeting people and chatting. The local Mencap group was amazing. Their project leader works so hard. Some weeks, Claire was on their Facebook chats three times a week, mixing with people she can't visit or touch, but people she knows very well. They had these Zoom discos too, and Claire would come in and scream and shout and dance. You know, she had a lovely time. We went through some tricky times as well, just normal family emotions. Everyone was seeing too much of the people they lived with during lockdown. Everyone needed some space. The hospital kept cancelling Claire's appointments, for instance, and that really sent her off the scale. We took her to one appointment during lockdown, and this very articulate doctor kept trying to explain to her about her chest problems. And she had a real go at him. You don't know what you're talking about, she told him. You've got to do something. I had to say to her, you can't go talking to someone like that. And of course, with Claire, when something like that happens, she doesn't drop it. We had it all the way coming back in the car. I think in the end I said, you go upstairs. I don't want to hear any more. Then when she got up the next morning, she started on it again and I had to tell her to stop. So you have these moments, but there's nothing serious about them. They're just done and dusted, nothing nasty. And since then, a doctor called up from a specialist unit at the Brompton Hospital, and they're going to scan her chest and do all these allergy tests, which is what we've been trying to get for years. So hopefully things will begin to improve for Claire. I do feel sorry for those adults with learning disabilities who don't have parents to help, or people whose parents don't want their children around. This pandemic, it's been easy for us, although it's been hard. We can't complain. We're retired, we haven't lost our income, we haven't fallen ill from the virus. There are a lot of people out there really suffering. There are a lot of people far worse off than us. Well, your own. I filled a huge suitcase with joggers and jumpers and loose cotton dress, a mixed berry bath bomb and wireless earphones. I left behind warning rat and my teddies. No need, Mum said, for children's toys. For Mum and Dad's tub, I look out over the neighbours of a growing garden. No baths in my flat for years. I'd fought for a walking sour. Dad needed space alone to feed the dog. Mum fed us fish and chips on Sunday whilst. I should help with the cooking, she said, but I thought of myself as their guest and yet I couldn't do clean the loose, dusting and polishing the lounge. No good for my lungs. I reading 
their boulders, sowed broad beans, sweet corn, sunflowers. They took months to grow and flowered for only two or three weeks. From April to August, my neighbors watered my garden, tending the daffodils of fusa I'd planted before. Bank from a conversation with a senior support worker. I remember the meals we cooked together after Claire came back. Well, she did the cooking, I have to say. I was just the one to suggest she add a few vegetables, get some greens on the go, jazz things up. That looks good, I'd say. That's enough for me. What about you? She always laughed at that. A long-standing joke. A bit of a gag. She did a pork chop one night, which came out really nice. She's a good little cook. A very tidy cook. Veg prepped in advance. Pork chop trimmed. I trained in catering as a late teen, and I worked in kitchens most of my life. I did a bit of everything. Sunday lunches at a local pensioners club, pubs, restaurants, staff canteens. But it got to the point where it wasn't fulfilling, and I very much wanted something more humane. I've just this week gone from bank to senior support worker. I think I can do some good work in this role, and it comes with a certain sense of security. With bank, I couldn't feel so sure about things. On a personal note, it's worked out for me. I won't be giving cooking support these days, but I'll be overseeing the other staff. And I'll still have plenty of contact with the tenants. I wouldn't do this otherwise. 102 days away. The grass colored shape and head height. Hardened trailing hawthorns and breaking glass. I'm stiff limped from streaming and raking. My hair's Untarded, picking red currants with friends, our laughter reaching across the spared length between us. Pete, a walking scarecrow, masters and beard, dyed green for the NHS. The eyes stinging of onion and running bean chutney, the bittersweet smell of loganberry jam, sterilising jars and stock the pantry before the return of wintry days. Masked from a conversation with a social enterprise project worker. For me personally, it's been a fascinating journey. My initial reaction to lockdown, sheer terror. I can remember thinking, I can't be locked down. I have to be out and about. During the early days, when we didn't have any trainees on site, I took on the role of delivering emergency food bank parcels to people who were vulnerable and couldn't get out. Initially, I was delivering to mostly homeless people who'd been brought in off the street. Some placed in empty accommodation with nothing, absolutely nothing, other than their personal belongings. I remember opening the door to a couple of men, giving them bags of food, only for them to say they didn't want most of it because they didn't have the facilities to cook it. I delivered to families who were struggling, women who were fleeing domestic abuse, people who'd been made redundant, and who would never have thought they'd be needing emergency food packets. I remember one day driving into a large hotel complex and suddenly realising that it was now a refugee centre. I'd had my wedding reception at that hotel, and now my memories of that have been skewed. I remember driving into the hotel car park, and there were groups of men, possibly from Africa, and people who must have been from all over were sitting there and staring at me as I was dropping off bags of food. I came away from the whole experience feeling incredibly humbled, having met the whole of society almost. I remember driving through town and the streets were empty, no people around, no cars, 
the sky as blue and as vibrant as ever I've seen it. Wild animals were starting to appear. Deer came into the local parks and into the garden here. It was as if Mother Nature had said, right, okay, my turn now. As lockdown began to ease, more and more people came out. But all of a sudden, they were masked. They were faceless people. And gradually the roads filled up, the parks completely filled. That lusciousness and the beauty of the countryside and nature was taken over by all these people. People who'd been caged in, cooped up. When Claire came back to the site, I got the sense of a huge sigh of relief. She was glad we were still here, glad to be mixing with people again, glad to be catching up with people she might only have seen via Zoom. I had seen her in person, actually, a good few times during lockdown. After she'd moved into her parents' home, we'd put packs together for our trainees, and there were different ones each week. Colouring sheets, bread making, cake making, grow your own seeds. Staff drove around in the minibus, dropping them off. It was a good way of the trainees seeing that they were still part of our community. They hadn't left. We were still in contact. We hadn't gone anywhere. I did Claire's round. It was a good way of connecting with Claire and her parents. When people just come into the centre, you only see them. But visiting their spaces gives a different slant on who the trainees are seeing their family home and meeting their parents. It was great to see Claire's mum and dad joining in with Claire's activity packs, taking an interest in what she was doing. It was lovely to see that they had sown the seeds together, that the plants were starting to grow. Claire has opened up with me, and we've talked about a number of things that had gone on prior to lockdown and after. We've got a good relationship, I like to think. So yes, we have had a few conversations of late. The kitchen is a really important place for conversation, a very sensory space. From taste and touch to sound, sight and smell, the senses do evoke conversations, enable us to explore ourselves. If someone wants to say something, they might not want to make eye contact. It might be difficult to really look at someone. Sometimes it's easier to be stirring vats of jam or chutney, to be standing alongside someone instead of standing in front of them. Flashbacks, invisible, my superpowers, sensing the shadows like a late blooming flower in the grey of day. Even roses cover my petals, protect invisibly my superpowers. But clock in camouflage hour by hour, I press for normal, forbidding to flower the old fussing love song. Test, spoil, and sour. Can't bring good times back, but invisibly my superpowers. He looks at my bus stop, jeers and flowers, and yet I grow tall, no longer gagged by his gift of scent or flowers. Against the urano, his hands creep lower, his mouth praising my invisibility, my superpower, but at break of day, my word will flower. Unmute. From a conversation with a holistic therapist and coordinator of a speaking up group for adults with learning disabilities and differences. I've worked with people with learning disabilities for over 27 years now, but in 2011, I shut down my session or support business. I'd been attacked by the park owner on the park where I lived. 
I couldn't keep speaking up for and protecting the residents on the park, working full time and also resolve my own trauma. At that time, I'd been working a 70 hour week. My husband would hardly see me. I'd go to work, come back and go into the office at home and work until two in the morning on park issues, get some sleep. And then I'd start again at eight. It was a cycle I'd got myself into that I needed to break. So I stopped everything and went to South Africa for a month at my husband's insistence. And when I came back, I just picked up some small work projects and slowly supported my own recovery. About three months later, I completed my Reiki mastership. I went back to college and slowly and organically, my holistic business developed. I run regular gong bath sessions now and I offer massage treatments, various types of energy healing, which I also teach. And I run regular guided meditations. During lockdown, I couldn't do much holistic therapy. So I asked myself what I could do to help. I went back to working in residential care during that time as an activities coordinator. Besides that, I set up a weekly online meditation session. It was an inclusive one, so anyone could join. But its focus was around using sound and singing. I channel the archangels through my voice, which harmonizes the space. And the guided meditation supports people to relax and rest and be in their heart space while they let their imagination take them on a guided healing journey. Claire has been coming pretty religiously to these online meditation sessions. It was an easy step in a way for her to join this group because we'd done some meditation work before and I attuned Claire to Reiki so she could support herself too. When I first met Claire, she was really struggling to speak up and voice how she felt, a sense of being locked in. I thought to myself, how do I support this? One day, Claire and I drove out to a nearby woodland and we took my drum with us. We walked through a grove of beech and silver birch until we found an oak tree under which we set up the drum and put some crystals around, rose quartz for opening the heart space, selenites for clearing energy fields, black tourmaline for turning negative energy into positive. I have so many crystals, I could fill my garden with them. And there, we just started this process of drumming. Think about something in your life that you want to let go of, I said, and just drum. I kept a beat while Claire was drumming. There was suddenly a freedom in Claire's ability to drum. It just happened. It was lovely to see. Afterwards, I asked her, what do you want to put into that space now? What do you want to fill it up with? Then we drummed that in. It gave Claire the chance to clear feelings and thoughts without needing to share. You could see the shift in her face. She just felt safer, I think, and reconnected with herself. Often we absorb the fears of others, especially if it matches a fear we hold within us about ourselves. Fear changes the way we see the world. So if we let go and release these fears, we can truly see ourselves. One of the guided meditations we did online recently was about clearing the energy of others so that we can see ourselves. We are all beautiful underneath our reactions. So when we let go of those feelings and fears, the beauty of ourselves comes forward. And that's a challenge for someone who may have been told that they're not good enough or that they have to hide themselves to be safe in the world, play themselves down. Claire is going through a time of adjustment. She's gaining her power back. It's nice to be an effective part of supporting healing processes. Mostly, I get a lot out of that. Now that restrictions have eased, I've stopped doing the key worker job and started up more of the holistic treatments again, the gong baths, healing work, teaching and meditations. The speaking up group I coordinate for adults with learning disabilities and differences had been meeting again, each volunteer sitting at a different table and working on separate iPads. We bought some cheapish tablets and internet access cards to lend to those who don't have them. And we did sessions on how to connect to Zoom and how to search on Google. 
But unfortunately, we had to take the decision recently for the safety of everyone to once again do the rest of our meetings online. Our Zoom practicing together should hopefully mean that most of the group can join in from their own homes. We're all asking, will we or won't we lock down again? Underneath my skin, at first glance, no one sees. Walsh chicken in the bin, smoky quarter, and thunder eggs. My disability, you keep on staring. You praise my new tech bones chuckle. At my angels, Titans insist that nothing's wrong. My neck is too shocking. Opening up from a conversation with Claire's sister. This year has been strange for a lot of people, but I imagine for Claire, it must have been worse. She was in the most vulnerable category because of her asthma. For 12 weeks, she wasn't even supposed to take a short walk. And she's still quite cut off, I suppose. She doesn't drive. She tried to learn for a long time. The instructor said that she couldn't get out of second gear because she was so paranoid about the cars coming towards her. She wanted a moped, but she was too anxious on the road. It must be frustrating, not being allowed to be the same and do the same things as everyone else. I can get into my car and pop over to see my friends. She can't just do that. She has to ask someone to help. That's got to be hard. That must be horrible. Especially at the moment. Her mode of transport is bus or taxi, you see. And right now, nobody really wants to get on either of those things. Especially somebody with asthma. Before COVID, Claire used to go to clubs two or three times a week. They're her life. That's what she's got. That's her routine. But her routine could be quite demanding on my mum and dad because they would drop her off and pick her up, 20 minutes there, 20 minutes back. And in the winter, of course, they're waiting for her in the dark. During lockdown, my dad had his own health problems. So there's the added pressure of that. And I'm two and a half hours away. You weren't supposed to see people, weren't supposed to mix. I'm not there. I'm not really in their lives. I've been out here in the country for 13 years now. I relocated up here when I met my husband. It was a big move for me. I've got an older son from a different marriage and another son from this marriage. And we've obviously built a life for ourselves. It's a lovely life, actually, up here on our small holding. Nice to be able to open your doors and not worry about someone breaking in. You wouldn't do that down south. Claire loves the livestock we have up here. She's very kind, very kind to animals. And she's not nasty to other people either. She's very sort of just nice. After lockdown had begun to open up, I went to see my parents for a long weekend and Claire came over for Sunday dinner. That was the first time I'd seen them since Christmas. It was a long time since we'd all been together. Then Claire and my parents house sat for me at one point, and my eldest son and I went away with them to Cornwall in early autumn too. It was the first real time we'd all spent together in ages. It was really nice, lovely actually. Lots of walks in the fresh air. But as we were driving home, my son said, I get where you come from, Mum. Your childhood must have been very different to mine. And it was as if somebody had turned the light on. Somebody could actually see how I'd felt as a child. I think as a child, I was a bit bitter. I felt I'd missed out on so many things. It's a different relationship than my own children have got, even though there's 10 years between them. They get the same jokes, they can laugh at the same things. Whereas Claire was a difficult child, very demanding, lots of tantrums. I suppose it was her frustration that she couldn't communicate, couldn't understand things. 
I see my friends going shopping with their sisters or meeting in town for coffee. Claire and I don't necessarily do things like that. And I kind of feel a little bit like I was cheated out of that. Which sounds like I'm being really selfish and a bit of a baby. But my parents spent a lot of time with Claire when we were growing up. I appreciate, obviously, that she wasn't as independent as me. And I suppose they thought I didn't need that. They worried about her constantly, I suppose. How she'd be perceived by others. The limitations on her independence. They still do spend a lot of time doing stuff with Claire. And sometimes I kind of think that I missed out on that as well. But I've learned more from my children growing up with Claire. When they've gone to things like our Christmas clubs. Because you don't always see these people out in the community. And some of the people in some of Claire's clubs, they have really severe disabilities. My kids are not in any shape or form bothered by it. They would never call them names or giggle or anything. So I've learned from my children the empathy they have. Now, I descend hillsides and emerge from woodlands before the August sky burns blue. The air becomes running damp. My sister's chickens clacked on their warm clutches as I fetch their blue eggs from behind. When the day molts to dusk, the sea bleats for the evening feed before rain quietly in the hay. Heat of autumn sparks the air. The slaughterhouse still a month away. Face to face from an interview with a local Mencap project leader. If anybody had said on that day in March that we would still be doing this at Christmas, I think we'd probably have all collapsed, wouldn't we? But stage by stage, we've just sort of got through it. We're back in the office now. On the day you return, you're very wary, aren't you? There are other people going through this building and you don't know who's got it and who's carrying it. But actually, it's much better to be in the office, much better to run a service when there are two of you here. Working from home isn't ideal because, you know, some people don't have the luxury of a room to turn into an office. Sometimes my colleague ended up perched on the end of a bed with her computer on her knees. I'm lucky, I've got a spare bedroom with a little desk in there. The only thing I missed was the office chair because the dining room chair is not comfortable to sit on for days on end. I had my laptop in there. I had the work phone to make calls and the iPad to do video chats. My life was literally on the screen or on the phone. You see, when COVID hit, we had to stop all our usual activities. It's bizarre, isn't it? Because everything has just been crossed out. So, you know, we do a monthly gateway club, a monthly football club, and everything was just sort of crossed out. You know, January and February happened. And then in March, time stood still. We asked ourselves, what are we going to do to stay in touch with our members? So we started doing these video chats on Facebook Messenger, 17 or 18 of them a week, each one for an hour with a different group of members. It was a really good way of chatting, keeping in touch, sharing any worries, any concerns. We've been doing quizzes and games and fortnightly online discos. The virtual discos are fab. We all send our requests to the DJ prior to the disco and he sets up in his house unmuted. Then he'll say, this one's for Claire, and he'll play our song. A lot of us have bought disco lights. So we put our lights on and some people get up and dance. Some people just sit around, some people drink. Their families join in if they want to. A lot of the parents have said that it was a joy to hear the sound of their child's laughter after they've been cooped up in their room for hours on end. That their child's mood lifts for the rest of the day. We're still doing the online discos and the video chats now. Lots of our members like their routines and this has become the norm. It's easy, sit in the lounge, switch a video on and you're there. 
being entertained for an hour. It's great, isn't it? You don't have to wear smart trousers because all people see is your head. We're going to be hard pressed, to be fair, to wean them off the video calls. But we've also started going back to some face-to-face -face activities. Throughout August, we did trials, meeting up with some of our members to give them MenCap hats, just to meet up with them, really, to see what they understood about social distancing, hand washing and stuff. And actually, they were all brilliant. There were no concerns of any of them. They all kind of got it. We have one lad who hasn't got a very high attention span. So during face-to-face -face activities, you know, he'd sit, wander, sit, wander. On the video chats again, he comes on and off. You know, within the hour, he might come on for 10 minutes, then disappear, come back, you know, which is fine. That's what it's all about. However, in person nowadays, it's a different matter. Now you can't just wander around freely because there are other people to consider. So my aim was to get him on a video chat for a whole hour. We literally geared the whole video chat for his likes, which happens to be Elvis. We did the whole thing on Elvis and we kept him on for a whole hour. And now that we've restarted some of our face-to-face -face activities, he came to one of them and he was just so sensible, just accepted that he couldn't wander around. We've been holding things like film nights in social clubs and picnics in church halls. Our members bring their own food and drink. We don't use kitchen facilities in any of the halls. They literally come in, they hand gel, and they're allocated a chair at the end of a table. They're all socially distanced, and we open the windows to ventilate the halls. So it's a strange thing, but that's okay. It means that we can be social. Our members are just so grateful to be out to be face to face outside their four walls. Trying to keep everybody safe, that's our priority. But also we're aware that people do need to socialize and it doesn't matter how many risk assessments we do, we can't guarantee that nobody's going to catch COVID. But as long as everybody's aware of that, we do everything we can to keep ourselves safe. That's all we can do. Obviously, parents were very nervous. At the first picnic, we had two staff and four members, and two of the members came with parents. But we reassured them as much as we could, and the parents were happy to leave them. That says it all, really, doesn't it? If they're happy to leave their loved ones with us, we must be doing something right. Picnics in the rain, when the sun is out, our conversation sounds brighter. Autumn creeps close. We climb cornice cliffs. Our limbs are working. Lungs see air tide. Our last gasp before the season sift. Virgil Tisco, my song grows wild yet. The colonel's aids rips tartly. For beneath black clouds, my breath labors quietly into air through my drum speaks, my muffled tubs edging towards a far happy beat at picnic tables. They open umbrellas, the people who gathered to the beat of my drum. Pensing, toddlers, addicts, and couples long red beneath the hearts of the widow. Nay, hear my life thrum 